Okay, welcome back. So the next speaker is Jens Barusan, um, speaking on time evolution on the information lattice and ultra slow growth of number entropy in MBL. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to start by thanking the organizers. So I'm going to talk about two things. Actually, mainly I'm going to talk about this time evolution on the information lattice. And then at the end, I will maybe advertise our new work a little bit on ultra slow growth of number entropy. These are the people that have done the work. Uh, the information lattice idea kind of came from Thomas, so he has, has given a lot of the ideas on the information lattice. So the motivation for what I want to talk about is, uh, is something we've heard quite a lot about in the, in the last few talks. So you could imagine, you know, you, have, you make some friends from, from some uh, local product state, there's some generic Hamiltonian that thermalizes, and then you follow the evolution of this state for a long time. And if it's a generic Hamiltonian, you expect that a long time it thermalizes, which means that it will have volume law entanglement and all local observables will be thermal, meaning that they, if they have the same expectation values in the, as in the thermal state. And these expectation values are also smooth functions of energy. Now, what this means, uh, since all the local observables are thermal independent of the initial state, uh, and we have a lot of volume law entanglement, it means that the details of the long range entanglement don't really matter. It, it matters that the entanglement is there because what the entanglement is doing is making the, the reduced density matrix on the local scale mixed. And it's that mixed nature of those local density matrix which is giving you th the thermalization. But since, since there, this is all smooth functions of energy and the eigenstates at different entities, as you've heard also earlier, have very different structure, it really means that there's a lot of information that's kind of contained in the long range entanglement that really isn't uh, important. Now, what is the motivation for, for this discussion or the problem that I want to try to solve uh, is how to simulate thermalization dynamics to long times. So suppose I want to be able to start from some product state, I want to simulate and I want to get into the uh, thermal state. This turns out to be a very hard problem precisely because of the volume law entanglement. I could imagine, for example, using some kind of major other states algorithms. Those only work as long as I can capture all of the entanglement. And if the entanglement can becomes large, I need to stop my uh, simulations. So that's, that's a motivation. But more generally, what I want to try to understand, or, or I want to kind of develop methods to understand is, how do I understand the kind of entanglement on various scales? And that is the information lattice. So uh, the information lattice is a way of basically doing this organization. So it, it's a way of taking a wave function and mapping it into taking a picture of it, where the picture, where the x-axis is location and space, and the y-axis is somehow the scale of information or entanglement. So this particular picture is of a random singlet state, and I'm going to explain exactly how to build up this picture. But to do that, I want to... I want to do this in, in, in kind of a slow way, starting from the very, very simplest entangled state. But first, what, what is entanglement? And I'm pretty sure you all know this, but I still want to do this just to make sure that I define things properly and we're all in the same space, same, same age. Entanglement is, of course, the characteristic trait of quantum mechanics set by Schrodinger already in 1935. Well, of course, he didn't use the word entanglement. Uh, and the idea here is I, I have some uh, Hilbert space and it's a product space between A and B. So I have a bipartition of my Hilbert space. And I imagine I take some state in this Hilbert space and I'm going to assume that state is pure. Uh, and if that state is not a product state between A and B in any basis, then rho has entanglement between A and B. And if I now want to ask what kind of information about the state can I get locally in A? Well, the information that's accessible in A is, is contained in the reduced density matrix of, of A. It is obtained by tracing out B from, uh, from the full state. And this is true because any expectation value of any operator that's local in A is going to be, be given by trace over rho times O. Therefore, if rho is entangled, then all information that's in the full state cannot be accessed locally in a and B. That is to say, entanglement is non-local information. And 
the way that Bell says this is quantum correlations are locally inexplicable. But how much information is accessible locally? So let me, in this case, take a, a, a chain of atoms and its, its side is just spanned by, it's basically a cube. Now, if, if the reduced density matrix is pure, then in principle, I have access to LA uh, bits of information if I have LA sides here. While if the density matrix is identity, then I have access to no information at all. I don't know anything about the full state. In between, the accessible information in the locally is, is the von Neumann information. It is just the difference between the maximum uh, information I can have, number of bits, minus the von Neumann entropy, von Neumann entanglement entropy. So given this, I want to understand what is the distribution of information in a given state. Let's start with a very simple state, with a singlet state. So there is no information in the single sides of the sing singlet. I can make any measurement locally on a single spin, but it will not tell me anything about the full state. And this is reflected in the fact that the density matrix of a single spin is just the identity. It is maximally entangled, and therefore there is no information, no bit of information I can extract about the state in, in the single sides. All the information is rather in the two sides together, because the total uh, total entropy of the full state being pure is, of course, zero, which means that there are two bits of information in the, if I do two-side measurements. Now, we should contrast this to a state which would just be a thermally mixed state of two sides. In this case, of course, there's no information either in the single sides, but also there's no information in the two-side two states. Um, so I want to draw this now like this. So this is, the, I have two sides. In the two sides, now this white means there's no information, but there's this red thing means that there's one bit of information at the scale L equals to one. And what this scale L equals to one means is that if I go take this triangle below it, that's these two sides. That means that I would need to measure these two sides in order to obtain this information. More formally, what this is showing is the mutual information on the scale L equals to one, which is the information that's contained in these two sides, but is not individually contained in either of the two sides. So next, I take a three-state side. I take the greenberger horn salinger state, which is this one. Now, this also has no information on single sides. If I, if I trace out uh, everything but uh, one spin, then all the, all the single side density matrices are identities. There's no information that I can extract about the state in, in single spin measurements. There is some information on two sides. Namely, if I take, for example, if I trace out the third one and look at the density matrices of, of side one and two, it's this uh, entangled state here, it has one, one bit of entanglement, and therefore there is one bit of information on, on scale one. Again, there's this triangle, there's one bit of information here, which means that I have some information in these two spins together. Uh, there's also information on three sides, since, uh, since this is not a pure state, that means that there must be some information on higher scale, and that turns out to be one bit of information there. So if we look at this side, that means that uh, there is information on these three sides, which are not contained in either of the lower uh, states. So more generally, on, on scale three, again, there's this kind of mutual information. It's the information in the three sides, which is not contained in either of the two sides. But when I subtract the information in the two sides, I double subtract the information in, in this, this overlapping one, so I have to add that one back. Okay, so now let me look at a little bit larger uh, singlet states. So if I just take a product states of neighboring singlets, then there is one bit of information here. And there is no information anywhere else, and one one bit of information here, and so on. Uh, I mean, how do you represent that? Because well, uh, here in this picture, it's hard to see because I do have a color scale which is just white or or, or uh, red. But that's because I have singlets where the, all the information is always one bit. But I would have, in principle, a value here continuous value that, that will tell me how much information is. Okay. But yeah. for this particular one, I don't have that. Okay. Here is a rainbow scar state where you see now for these two sides, I have one bit of information, but then I go up and all the way up here, I have uh, the, inf the entanglement between the end sides. So if I look at this one, that corresponds to these sides here. This is exactly the singlet between this side and that. And then there is a picture I showed you in the very beginning, which is the random singlet side, uh, random singlet, and that looks like that. So now I want to go and, and take a random state in Hilbert space. And I expect from the fact that random matrix data tells me that 
all, all eigenstates are basically a thermal at infinite temperature that somehow the information should be at maximum scale. But how exactly will it look like? I'll give you a second to, to guess before I show you the answer, which is this. Actually, all the information essentially is on uh, half the system size, and it decays uh, very rapidly away from that side. And that's easy to understand if you think about just uh, how, how many operators are there on different scales. On, on scale L over 2, that, that's the scale that gives you the most possible number of operators, and therefore most of the information will be on that scale. You might have thought I, I go on the larger scale, but there's only one operator on the larger scale. Uh, so it's, there's not much information that can be on the larger scale. So this is how uh, an infinite temperature thermal state looks according to the eigenstate thermalization it comes. So now I want to look at localization on the information like this, and I want to start with a topological superconductor. So these are uh, not fully finished uh, plots, so they're a little bit busy now, so let me, let me go through them a little bit slowly. Let's focus first on the one on the left, and I'll, I'll start with the, with the uh, inset. So this is some Kitaev model, and there's some disorder strength that tunes between two phases, so this delta is a local topological marker, uh, and when it's zero, you have a trivial phase, and when it's one, you have a topological phase. So if, if you're at large negative Delta, you're in a trivial Anderson insulator. If at large positive delta, you're, at, you're in a topological insulator. And now what I've done here is I've plotted uh, the information on a given scale summed over all sides. And if I start here at minus 2, so the minus uh, back, so it's supposed to be minus 2, that's the black curve here, I see that the information is exponentially localized at small scales. And when I increase the uh, disorder or decrease the disorder strength, that exponential localization becomes uh, less and less. And eventually it becomes completely flat at the critical point where basically the all information is on, on all scale. And then when I go into the topological phase, uh, it, it goes back. It starts to localize again at small scales, except there is a peak coming up at at the maximum scale, and that peak is just the Majorana bound states, uh, which you have in a topological superconductor. They are entangled uh, across the, the, the whole sample. And if I sum the total information in this peak here, it turns out to be one bit corresponding exactly to the edge state. I can, I can uh, oh, if I, if I fit the localization length, I see that it goes like this, so the, you know, it's maximum of the transition and it goes down. The different sides, and I could also look at the localization length of the Maya, and I'm just not plotting it here. And exactly at the critical point, I can also look at the information, and then it gives me this uh, central charge. Well, Majorana is always there if you are in the in the topological phase, even if this order is true. Yeah, but they, they will have, a, there's only one that has a, a entanglement across the full system, okay? So that's the uh, non interesting case. Now I add interaction. So I have a many body localization, which means that I have this Ising C2 model. So here I write it in terms of spins. Again, there is this log the topological marker that tells me that, okay, if delta is very large to be negative, I have a trivial many body localized phase or many body localized uh, free thermal phase, whatever you prefer. And at large delta, there is a topological many body localized state. And in between, this topological marker is, is somewhere between 0 and 1, and that's just because there is a, there's a small extended region in between the two localized phases. And here as well, I can see that in the trivial phase, the, all the information is localized and exponentially decaying at small scales. Same in the topological phase. Uh, in between here, all the information is in half of the system size, just as in the thermal state. But there is this one bit of, uh, one bit of information at, at the full system scale size, which corresponds to the, the bound state, the boundary states in the topological. So <clears throat> I can now do the same thing. I can try to fit to these curves to extract the localization length. And this localization length is small in the two phases, but it diverges as I go uh, through this transition to this, this extended phase. And in the extended phase, the localization length uh, has the opposite sign because 
it, it increases exponentially towards the, towards the center line. So I can see a very clear kind of <coughs> crossover or transition here. If, if I were to, if I were to do a Wigner Jordan transformation on this into my Aranas and then, okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's uh, using the information lattice to look at uh, static states or looking at some kind of either eigenstates or just some interesting states. But I can also do dynamics on the information lattice, trying to understand how, how when I do this quens from a trivial product state to to some thermal state, how is the evolution of the information during that <coughs> time evolution? And here I'm going to make a, 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 the simplest kind of dynamics I can have, which is just a random unitary circuit where all the unitaries are, are independent uh, unitaries, and they're even not going to be the same in every time step. So it's, it's, there's no conservation law. It will, it will just generate entanglement extremely quickly. In fact, if I look at this half chain entanglement, it just grows linearly and then saturates at, uh, at the Pates value. And it does, a, does so very quickly. But how does this same time evolution look on the, on the information lattice? So this is, this is the initial state. So I'm starting from some product state. If I have a product state, I can, on each side, I can, of course, extract the information about that the state uh, on each side. So all the information is now at the smallest scale. Now I apply one of these, these gates, and this is what happens to the information. It goes up, and it can go all the way up to uh, scale 4. So to understand why it goes to scale four, we can look here. Uh, in, one, in, in one time step, I apply both the even and odd gates. Uh, and this, this gate can entangle this side with that side. With this, uh, and this gate here entangles that side with that side. Then when I uh, apply this gate, it can then generate entanglement between the states here. So maximum entanglement range I can get is four sides. And that's exactly what I see here. I, I see four sides from generated. Uh, and then at the boundaries, there's a little bit less information, but the less information is simply because I don't apply a gate here. I only apply one gate per, per, per time step at the boundary. So that's one time step. Next time step, we, we see that the information is flowing away from uh, small scales. There's a little bit of information still here on the small scales at the boundaries. Which are, Flowing a little bit slower, but then it keeps going. It goes, it goes, it goes, going to larger and larger scales, and then quickly it starts to kind of get stuck at half the system size. And already at time fourteen, it looks ex exactly like the thermal state from a random. Now this is a <coughs> a very extreme case in the sense that there's no information left on the small scales. But if I have some conservation laws and I'm trying to get to some kind of a diffusive state, then actually there will be information left at small scales. And that information is essential to, to get the right local observables. So if I'm doing thermalization simulation, I do want to keep the information that's at small scales. Uh, the information that's gone up here is actually important to kind of give me reduced density matrix or thermal density matrix at low scale. But the details of, of what this is here is not so important. So in the next uh, few minutes, I'm going to explain a little bit of an algorithm that is an approximate algorithm. This is going to use this uh, insight here to, to make a algorithm that can simulate to large times, conserving exactly local observables. But kind of the information that goes to the large scales, I'm going to not exactly throw away, but I'm going to simplify it as much as I can. Uh, so kind of not keep all the structure that is at this scale for a given uh, state. Um, so how do I time evolve on the information lattice? So I, I, I want to, if I want to do something approximate, I basically don't want to know the full state ever, because if I know the full state, that is exponentially large, and, and I cannot go to large system sizes. Instead, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to look at these subsystems, and I'm going to just always only look at the reduced density matrix. So I'm just, I just have the reduced density matrices up to some maximum scale. And then when I do a time evolution, I'm just going to time evolve these density matrices. Now, that time evolution will have 
terms which just come from the Hamiltonian locally in the region of the subsystem, and that, that we, we can solve directly. But then there's also information which is at larger scale because of the interaction between different subsystems. And if I only keep the information up to some scale, then I don't actually have the information or the extensity matrix at the larger scale. Um, <clears throat> and when I time evolve, you know, in the beginning, maybe I have some maximum scale. There is no information. The information is on the lower scales. And as I time evolve, the information goes up in, in uh, to larger and larger scales, as we saw. But in the beginning, there's no information on the larger scales. And if there's no information on, on larger scales, then I can actually reconstruct the density matrix on larger scale from the density matrices on the lower scale. So I can actually do this time evolution, even if I don't, in principle, know this density matrix at the larger scale, I can reconstruct it using this recovery map. But of course, uh, this L star will increase with time. That's just uh, reflecting the growth of entanglement, which means that at some point, this, this recovery map will will fail because I'm trying to reconstruct uh, from lower states. But if there's information on larger scales, I cannot reconstruct it from the lower scale by definition. So somehow I need to be able to have a fixed L star. And when the information goes through it, I'm going to say, OK, once it's gone through it, it's not important anymore. The only role it's playing is to make my local density matrix mixed. But it's not going to come back. So I can kind of forget the details of that information. But there is a, there's a little bit of a catch, which is I need to keep track also of the flow of information. So I can define information currents on this information lattice. These are the equations. That's not very too much about the equations. Just believe me that I can define information currents. And if I'm looking at this, this region here, as so I'm looking at the density matrix here, there will be flow of information out of that region. Uh, it, no, no. At least not at infinite temperature, you won't. Uh, at lower, and maybe at finite, yeah. Um, you shouldn't if it remains. So if you just you just want to time evolve the state itself without doing yeah. any quenches. Yeah, time evolve. Yeah, yeah, no, that should that should be fine. Yeah. Uh, so if if uh, I think we we haven't checked this uh, carefully, but I think the answer will be this. So if the scale, the maximum scale of bits I have. Uh, my density matrix is, is larger than the thermal length scale of the Gibbs state, then it will, then it will be fine. If, if the thermal length scale is larger, then, then, then I have. Okay, so it, it's important that I keep, it turns out that it's important that I keep this current conserved, because if I, if I just throw away the information on large scales without keeping the current fixed, I will make mistakes. I can think of it as putting kind of a hard wall boundary, and there's a flow of information and it bounces back, and it bounces back to the low degrees of freedom, and that messes up my time evolution. But if I put a boundary conditions where the, I can keep the current fixed, I will be able to actually um, get the right simulation, the right time evolution. So this is how, how we do it. We just we, we basically shift the, the density matrix, keeping the lower density matrix fixed, and keeping the, the current fixed. This turns out to be just a linear projection, and then you maximize the entropy on the larger scales. So this is basically how you do it. We have now two scales. We, we evolve until some time, and then we minimize, minimize uh, the information, keeping the current. And here is some Ben Spark. This is the energy diffusion in the mixed field Ising model. These oscillations are because we have two scales, because I want to be able to estimate the current, so I need to Evolve to a large scale, but minimize at a smaller scale. So that's these oscillations, but they go away as I increase my scale of the density matrices, and eventually I can get, and I can get, go to very long times, and I can extract the fusion coefficients, uh, and everything works very well. So here I can see this is this is the, the, the coefficients of the of the of the diffusion and and. And uh, if I extrapolate in one over L min, I see I can get diffusion coefficient, a diffusion constant, the power log correct to be one, and I can extract the diffusion coefficients from the, uh, from from these scales. And since we have these density matrices, this is very nice because I can also I can also easily add dissipation locally on every scale, and and this has been used in some other projects with my postdocs. 
that I was not involved in. So I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, so that's that's the information that this I told you how I can use it to understand just entanglement in states, and then how to do time evolution on it, and then how I can do an approximate time evolution where I really systematically throw away entanglement at large scales, but I keep it at the small scales. And this one should maybe contrast with what matrix product states do. Matrix product states, they keep the states with the maximum entanglement, but you're not guaranteed that the maximum entanglement is the, the relevant entanglement for the observables that you're looking at, because most of the entanglement is a large scale, so most likely the states with the maximum entanglement will have a lot of long-range entanglement. It's, it's basically like an ED on, on, uh, on a matrix of the size of the larger scale. So the density matrix on larger scale is, is uh, 2 to the L times 2 to the L. And you need to do things which are kind of equivalent to, an, that's a dense matrix, and you need to do a kind of ED on it. Not exactly an ED, but yeah, that's a scale, yes. But, but I can do, um, but it, it doesn't scale with system size. So I can, and in fact, I can do infinite system sizes. The simulation here were for infinite system sizes. But I, yeah, I need to do that for every time step. But I can, I mean, if you do kind of wrong equipment for the time steps, so then you can, you can make the time steps a little bit larger than, uh, so it's not, so there are, there are some parameters there. Okay, in the last five minutes, I'm gonna just make an advertisement. It's a little bit like in the movies, you go see a movie, but then they show you, uh, you know, the highlights from another movie. So you, you see all the jokes and then you go and see the movie and you realize there are no more jokes in the actual movie. Um, I'm going to do the same here. I'm going to tell you all the highlights, but I'll, I'll do it maybe a little bit quickly because I only have four minutes. But the key concepts are, are kind of, I can, I can tell quickly. So the motivation for this work is, is really there are some microscopic models that seem to show ultra-slow growth of number entropy. So the number entropy is, is this thing here. If I have a conserved uh, chart, I can, I can split the von Neumann entanglement entropy into a number entropy and configurational entropy. But the number entropy is just the Shannon entropy of, of the probability of having a certain number of particles on the right or the left. Now, the, the interpretation of seeing this ultra-slow growth of the number entropy was that I, therefore, I must have particle transport. If I have particle transport, that means I don't have MBL. So that was the interpretation. Uh, that's the challenging MBL part. But uh, there were follow there were later work by people in the audience who said, well, actually, maybe you can understand this uh, using resonances in MBL. Uh, what we want to do is, is we want to really know, okay, so suppose I have L bits. What would I actually see for this? Number entropy. So we construct a circuit of L bits just from some random unitaries. Uh, these unitaries are given given here. Uh, maybe the only thing that's important is, I mean, these are basically just random unitaries where there's some mixing factors. So they're, they're not maximally uh, entangling, but they have some uh, some factor that determines how much entanglement they generate. But then I have this weight weight factor, which is basically if if the disorder on two neighboring sides are very close, then I, then I mix things more than I would otherwise. So then I get more entanglement if, if, if the disorder is, is uh, close. So this is how this L bit looks like. They have these exponential tails down to very large scales. And we keep a very large circuit so that we can really get these tails all the way down to basically uh, well, very small values. So this circuit kind of transformed from physical bit to L bit. In the L bit basis, there is a random Hamiltonian and it's just the L bit Hamiltonian. So what I now want to do is I just want to take a product state. I want to time evolve with, uh, with, this, with this Hamiltonian. But with this circuit, I can, I can start from the initial state with the product state in, in physical basis. I transform to the L bit basis. And then this is a diagonal matrix. So I can do a very long time uh, time evolution with that. There is tricks to go to extremely long times because we want to go to extremely long times and that's that, I mean, this will be e to the whatever this is, which will be a very large number. So I need to kind of make sure that I, I, I have enough uh, digits to take care of that. But that one can do. And this is what you see. This is, uh, you see, this is the entanglement entropy as a function of time. We go all the way up to 10 to the 13. 
where size is up to 28. We can even do 32. We just didn't did put it in this plot. Entanglement entropy does what you expect. It has a logarithmic growth that saturates at the volume. The number entropy has a much slower growth, something which looks like a log log of t. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to bet too strongly on that it's actually log log of t, but it, it is the best uh, functional form in our fit. Uh, we also tried some power loss, but this this seems to fit better over longer time. If, if I fit over long times, I just need two minutes or one minute. And what I see here is that I have this very slow growth. Uh, and if I look at the saturation value, it, it increases and it re increases a little bit like a log and I cannot say whether it will saturate or it will keep increasing. But the time scale of, local, of, the, of the saturation for the entanglement entropy is, is e to the L and for the number entropy is e to the, seems to be e to the uh, L over two. And I don't really know a good explanation for this factor of two, but I'm sure there's, so that's, that's all. There is information at this. I've told you everything about. The uh, kind of conclusion to take away from this, I think, is the LBIT model is actually, if you really make LBITs with a many body LBITs, which have particle fluctuation, it's a pretty rich model. And one has to be a little bit careful in, in you know, comparing results from the microscopic models to the, to the LBIT models before one is sure what the LBIT model actually does. And it can do things that you maybe wouldn't expect it to do. And in, in fact, in the old days, we didn't expect to see such, such, a, such an increase of the number entropy in LBIT model. That being said, I cannot, since this is an LBIT model, I cannot directly say whether what is seen in the microscopic model is the same thing I'm seeing here. But at least it tells us that one has to be careful before making Conclusion about what you see in the microscopic models. And that's it. So thank you for your attention. Thanks, Jens. Uh, questions, yeah. I, I wonder, did you think about like merging your like numerical method with kind of sort of thermodyn uh, hydrodynamics? So in the sense that you evolve for a while density matrix, and at some point you decide it's thermal, and say you forget completely all the information and say you have local temperature, whatever, and then continue with normal. Because the problems usually with short times, right? Because at short times there's no hydrodynamics and so on. But how? You, you mean to do do like an exact, like maybe polar state time evolution at long times after you get no, to Even the with your method. So you start from some, I don't know, density matrix, right? And you propagate it uh, the way you do. But at some point, probably, usually, if you reach big enough scale, it might become thermal. I mean, it, it does that. That's that's basically what it does. So so that's yeah. so we don't need to kind of replace it by a thermal one. It yeah, but you might get thermal. inhomogeneous like temperature in the system, right? So it can become locally thermal, but the system still didn't thermalize. Or oh, that's right. Yes. So you mean? I see what you mean. Um, to and after that, you just write, you know, some diffusion equation for energy or something like that, and then you have like continuous evolution from zero to infinity. That's right. I did not. We did not try that, but that, that uh, in principle should work. Yeah. So just make a. So w once you're at some large time, you, you you kind of get your densities, let's say, or whatever quantity you're looking at, and it's your whatever, and then you use just diffusion equation on that is what you're suggesting. Yeah, yeah that one can do. Okay, so if not, if there are no more questions, let's tag in.